Keeping It Real with Janine, your guide to living an authentic, healthy life. Today's conversation is with Melissa Harris, a visionary artist painting the stories of women. I think you will find her journey as an empathic artist to be inspiring as she has stayed true to her authentic self throughout. Melissa Harris combines her background as clairvoyant with her artistic abilities to create spirit essence portraits. She tunes into the person and creates a narrative painting from imagery that appears to her from a trance-like state. These images are organized in a way that her clients find helpful on their path of development. She is very focused right now on teaching, and she loves teaching. She's created destination workshops and online courses, which we'll be talking about. She's also created the beautiful card deck, Creatrix Anything is Possible Activation Cards, as a tool for women to tune into for comfort, advice, and inspiration. My sister Julie sent me a deck as a gift, and I must say it is all Melissa strives it to be. Beautiful, inspiring, and comforting in times of challenge. I've used it several times already. Melissa has also written a beautiful memoir of her journey as an artist, Painting Outside the Lines, and she's also written another book, 99 Keys to a Creative Life, both which you will be able to find on her website, which we'll let you know about later. Hi, Melissa. Thank you for being on my podcast. Hi, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so grateful. I've been wanting to focus on artists. And uh, in fact, I think that will be my first question now that I think about it. What does being an artist mean to you? Oh, that's a really, that's a really <laughs> good question. Um, I would say what that means to me. Actually, I feel that we are all artists. And so being an artist, I would say, means... Um, being more in touch with the right side of our brain than we normally walk around being in our current society. Um, I think uh, we're working a lot, we're thinking a lot, we're using technology a lot. And when we're in the right side of our brain, we are in a more receptive mode, such as when we are meditating or simply sitting in nature and simply being. Mm -hmm. So uh, as an artist, we do need to be um, open and available to inspiration. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to do that when we are in the right side of our brain. So, um, you know, having worked with so many people that feel like they have no talent, um, they don't belong in my class, they're not an artist. So what is an artist? I mean, I have seen that everybody is an artist. It, it means um, being open to inspiration and taking that inspiration and turning it, being a little bit of an alchemist, and turning it into a creation that is satisfying to oneself. Mm -hmm. So I think what I'm hearing is that if someone feels like they'd like to nurture the creative or artistic side of themselves, but they don't really feel like they have any talent, you can help them to nurture that and bring it out. Oh, yes, absolutely. Cool. Um, what might be something that, is there something that you could share that someone could do right now to uh, maybe one thing that could move them closer to uh, exploring their artistic side? Um, hmm. uh, I would say in general opening, and that is a really broad, if I could say one word, that's a really broad term. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I mean is um, opening up to what it is that uh, turns them on and paying attention to what turns them on. Does that address the question? Yes. And so I, actually, this is very interesting. It dovetails with another podcast episode that I'm going to be doing with Janet Atwood on finding your passion and figuring out what your passion in life is. So uh, that, would, that will be something that will be helpful for someone who doesn't know what their passion is. They're still trying to figure that out. Yes, and I have come across that a few times too. And you know, for me, I always suggest that people carry 
uh, a journal, that they carry a camera, that they carry a recorder, so that when they have that feeling of, um, I would call it excitement inside, mm -hmm. that they are taking note of that and taking a moment to jot that down or record it or however they're going to remember it so that if they are looking for inspiration later or if they are looking for something to do or what might bring them some excitement that they have made note of that and it's like oh yeah well I really did like that concert and um, for me often music will make me want to paint mm -hmm. so you know could I call that a passion could I call music a passion yes um, it doesn't mean that I am necessarily going to make music myself but it is something that inspires me Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So looking for things that inspire you and either writing it down or recording it or taking a photo, that sounds like an excellent first step. Yeah, I think that for me, I, w I do suggest that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so what medium do you work in or various mediums do you work in? Because being an artist can you know, that covers a lot of ground. <laughs> yes. And I mean, if I had a million lives <laughs> and could clone <laughs> myself, I'd be working in actually a lot more mediums because um, I like them all. I really do. I like to sculpt. I like the three dimensions. I like all of it. But for me, I have to limit it to just a couple. So I mostly these days work in watercolor because it's so portable and I like mm -hmm. to travel. I like to combine the, uh, I like to combine travel with my art. And um, I do like to, to oil paint. I tend to work larger if I oil paint, so it's not as portable. Mm -hmm. Those are my two favorites. Mm -hmm. I find watercolor to be more difficult just because you can't cover it up or, you know, with, with acrylics or oils, how you can alter a mistake a lot easier than you can with a watercolor. Well, there's kind of ways to cheat, <laughs> but, but I, I try not to use them, and I try not to tell my students about them, but it's true that watercolor is definitely the least controllable mm -hmm. of uh, the mediums. But it's so beautiful. I love your watercolors. I think they're so, so beautiful. They're so, um, oh, I had a, oh, darn it. The word is escaping me right now, but when I was looking at them the other day, I, there's a word that came to me it begins with an e maybe i'll think of it later mm -hmm. that i thought uh that kind of described your uh evocative there it is <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um yeah i just i really love your work actually i think it's it's quite lovely so mm -hmm. how did you start i uh was reading that you know as a child you felt you were different and as soon as you could hold a, a crayon in your hand you started drawing but you you weren't really uh, well received, I, I believe, with, with your sensitivities, that your mom thought you were too sensitive. And, you know, when you would feel things from other people, they didn't really understand. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that and how that influenced your becoming an artist in your life? Um, well, I think that uh, people who do put uh, their, their focus in the arts and in, in anything creative um, do tend to be sensitive in general. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, I'd say it has had an effect on my own artwork because um, it allows me to know uh, what it is that is affecting me or calling me. So for me, it hasn't been difficult for me to know what to paint or how I want to express myself. I, and I think, yes, to some degree, it is due to my sensitivity. And, you know, the fact that it was not well received, you know, I, I suppose that's not entirely fair to my parents. They did give me art classes because they, they noticed that, um, that I really loved it. They didn't encourage me to become an artist, but I have a strong will and, you know, maybe someone else is, is not going to be that willful. So I did push through it and was able to bypass some of the discouragement that I received, both from my parents and also in art school. Um, there were a few teachers that maybe were not that 
encouraging or positive. And I'm just grateful that I, uh, my ego was strong enough to be able to withstand that criticism because I'm rambling a little bit here, but no, as no. I, I think this is important because, um, you know, what, what do you do for someone who's listening, who, um, their, their dream, their passion, their artistic sense is being squashed or not encouraged because, um, I think very often a parent can feel like, you know, you're not going to be able to make a living doing that. Um, you know, uh, maybe they encourage it as a sideline, but not as, you know, something to really do. And I think this is important how you, how you worked through that. Um, I do think it's an individual thing and I, I, every soul has its path. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like this, this has been part of my path. So I have observed uh, many people that come through my doors are people that come because they know that I'm a gentle teacher. They've been discouraged a lot. So if you're asking me what I think someone could do if they've been discouraged a lot, is that what you're asking? Um, no, I wasn't, but I, I think that's a great question. Well, okay, well, we'll go with that one then, and then we'll go back. But if someone has been discouraged a lot, um, I think they're going to have to sit down and, and be quite honest with themselves and and be ready to possibly receive some criticism, because as an artist, we do receive, it's kind of the nature of the game. Um, I've been rejected probably more times than I've been accepted, and I've been accepted to some great things, but I've also been rejected a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, as an artist, the nature of being an artist is, yes, you're going to receive some criticism. So it's time to kind of get still with yourself and love yourself and know that it's not anything personal and that everyone receives criticism, and the, uh, it's just time to to move on and walk forward in spite of that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and find a teacher that's not going to be hard on you, because that's not going to help anybody with anything. True. So let's talk about your your clairsentient abilities, and your because you feel things. Would you consider yourself psychic, or or more intuitive um, or no, absolutely i do um it's not something right now i'm putting a whole lot of time thinking about or focusing on um mm -hmm. i have at points in my life done psychic readings regularly and when i was first discovering that i had this ability which we all have by the way too that <laughs> that's another conversation uh, i decided um to really work with it and at that time i had uh i had time i was on a grant i was living in paris i was on a grant for painting so i was practicing my channeling mm -hmm. and my um clairvoyant readings and they were also clairsentient and empathic began to turn into uh, where I was being instructed to put my hands on parts of people's bodies and make particular sounds, which nowadays we would call toning. And I didn't really have any instruction. I was just doing very deep listening. So I felt uh, that I, it wasn't really right for me to be doing something like that unless I was instructed, that I had the proper instruction. So um, I came back to the States and went to Barbara Brennan's Hands-On Healing School, and she was one of the pioneers with this back in the day. Yes, I remember. I, I think I have her book still somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and I was in her class when it was just uh, 12 of us, and she was teaching the class, which was a very long time ago. Wow. Yes, it is a part of my being and very much a part of my life. It's um, not someplace I'm putting a whole lot of focus at the moment because there's only so much time and energy. And like I said, I'm really very much interested in my teaching right now. And, and that aspect of my life goes into my, who I am as a teacher because in my classes, um, the group becomes this organic um, body unto itself. So I really enjoy tuning in to what's going on with this whole organism and what does this person need and that person need and how can I balance the whole of the group for what's best for everyone at the same time. So in that way, I am using my, if you want to call it psychic abilities, but uh, sensitivities, and I really enjoy doing that. 
And I have, um, every year I do an expo in Massachusetts, a natural living expo, and I teach a class that's um, very popular for them called um, Developing and Using Your Psychic Awareness. And I do an exercise where people are working with each other just for maybe 20 minutes. And everyone is always amazed at how psychic we really are all of us you know it's so much fun to do that little exercise mm -hmm. so you know i do feel like we all are you know all are psychic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i would agree i would agree it's just a matter of getting in touch with it yep so how do you i mean i've noticed i noticed in your cards that there's a lot of well, how to express let's see there's a lot of energy in your your paintings that comes through it's there's there's a sense of realism but it's it's more than that there's like there's an energy that comes off of each of your paintings and i would imagine that uh from what i've read about you that it has to do with how you feel things how do you incorporate that into your art that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I talk about that a lot in my classes because it's not the first time I've been asked. Um, I think that part of that, for me, when I go into the studio, there's two different ways I approach it. Uh, I might have something very big going on in my life and I've, I'm going through a particular emotion, whether it's a negative emotion, quote negative, mm -hmm. um, or a happy emotion. And because I'm aware of that, I might decide on a subject matter that would illustrate that particular emotion. Um, as an artist, I'm actually really about putting emotion into my artwork as opposed to a different kind of artist who may be more of an abstract. Well, that doesn't mean they can't put emotion in if they're an abstract painter, but you know, maybe someone that likes to do very quiet uh, still lifes or um, floral paintings and it doesn't mean they can't put emotion into them either but I really am interested in being more of an expressive artist so I like being aware of uh, how I'm feeling at the time and hopefully finding subject matter that will express that I also choose my medium um, that would be in line with that sometimes. So if I'm feeling really excited or really angry, a very strong emotion, I might choose to work in oil paint because I'm standing while I'm painting when I'm oil painting. Mm. And my body energy goes into the painting more so than it would if I'm doing a watercolor where I'm sitting. Mm -hmm. and sometimes it is interesting and then sometimes you know, like a lot of my paintings um from the old days they're six foot oil paintings and i would just be standing there dancing and back and forth <laughs> and you know really literally dancing while i was painting now it's kind of hard uh, to do with watercolors <laughs> yes it is but i have a, i have one of my students does it yeah she really can, she, yep mm -hmm. well she won't sit while she watercolors she always stands so, um, and you know, as you go on with your studies, you know, and as you go on as an uh, learning who you are as an artist, you know what works for you. And then there's another approach whereby I might um, not know what I'm feeling, but all I know is I've got a day or a half a day and I really want to do some artwork. So I'll go into the studio. Sometimes I might look around at a painting that I've already started. And I just, without analyzing, will go right to that painting and, and start right in. And then later on, I'll realize, oh, yeah, well, I was called to that because it's such a soft painting and I'm really in a soft place. Or I might go in, I keep this accordion file of photos to work from when I'm not necessarily, when I don't necessarily have something in mind that I'm going to work on. And I'll go through the photos and I'll just intuitively without analyzing without thinking about it too much i'll grab a photo that um, is calling to me and then i'll start in with the photo and maybe a few hours later or maybe a few years later <laughs> i'll look back at it and i'll say oh yeah i can see now why i was working on that painting at that point in time so it's kind of i, I know i'm giving i've thought about this a lot i'm giving kind of two different answers okay. i i like to analyze where i am and see if i can find the subject matter or medium that's going to express that and sometimes i'll just jump right in and then look at that later but i do feel that um 
it's helpful to be fully present when one is making art because your presence is what is going into the piece of art and how do you become present well then that's a whole nother conversation and I always suggest to people if they want to sharpen their intuitive abilities, then um, meditation is the best tool that I can think of for doing that. And it's also the thing that most people don't really want to spend time doing, but mm -hmm. it does bring us more present. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's probably not from your perspective and from who you are, not a good idea to try to paint when you're brain is scattered and you're thinking about other things that are bothering you or that you have to do or something like that, that you want to be fully focused and present when you're. Um, I wouldn't go that far because no? I would say, I would say if anybody, anyone wants to paint or create or sculpt or make music or whatever it is, um, if they have the urge at any point in time that that that's a good time to go and do it but it might be nice to be cognizant of the fact that oh yeah well i'm all over the place i don't really know what it is i want to paint or play or write about but i'm just going to start in so maybe i was a little bit confusing with with that um but i i think what i was trying to say is that i think some of the power that is in my artwork and the more successful pieces comes from being fully present but i don't i don't think no i don't think that um you know don't go do your art just because you're scattered <laughs> well actually now that uh now that i'm thinking about it when I, I was talking with my harp teacher the other day and we were talking about how playing the harp uses uh both the right and the left brain in kind of a different way and i said you know i do find that if something's bothering me because sometimes i'll just over and over and over think about something that's bothering me when i'm playing my harp it goes away i can't even think about it right and, yes. and maybe painting is the same would you say oh, yes just uh, sometimes sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but you know <laughs> in the best world yeah in the you know in our ideal yes it does so it can be a good way to to stop the what i call the monkey mind oh yes absolutely <laughs> So even if you're not a great artist, just get your get get your tools out, um, whatever they are. If you're like to sculpt or paint or or write, and just just do something, and it gets the monkey mind to to stop and be calm and quiet. Yeah. Yes. So, do you have regular practices that that help you stay grounded and connected? Besides, uh, you've talked about meditation, so I assume I would assume you meditate. Um, I do. Um, I should be a little bit more regular lately, but yes, I do. And um, for me, what is uh, really grounding is movement. I, I love to dance mm. and I love to swim. So those things do ground me. They keep me centered and um, being in nature, you know, those are the top three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine being in nature is easy for you. I noticed, I, I thought it was really nice that on your website, you have a little video of your studio and, you know, showing some of your paintings and some of the, the things that you do. And, and I noticed that it's, I believe you're in the cat skills, right? Yes. Yeah, so you're, it looks like you're out in nature, just naturally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my studio um, overlooks a meadow and the forest and I am on nine acres and um, yeah, most of my community is very big on being, you know, involved and, in, um, you know, with the outdoors. Yeah, we're, we're big into that. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you went to university to study art. I, I found it interesting just the other day because my husband has a uh, a teenage son who's starting to think about what happens after high school and he was very surprised that you could go to to college for art oh really <laughs> yeah he, he i kind of laughed to myself because i wasn't part of the conversation and i didn't want to butt in but i i was going to because i was going to say well you know i'm i'm interviewing this lovely woman tomorrow who who has her bachelor's and her master's degree in fine art yeah, well, I do. I mean, I did. I went to undergraduate. I have two degrees in painting, undergraduate and graduate. So, yeah, you can go to college for art. I mean, these days are different. I know they're not encouraging the arts as much, so I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
So where, where did you study? Where did you enjoy studying uh, art the most? Where, what do you think? Well, was- I went to so many different schools, and that's a very long story, um, undergraduate. And by the time I got to Syracuse, which was my last year um, where I did get my Bachelor in Fine Arts, I really did like the program at Syracuse University a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, I went to graduate school. I liked the program at graduate school, too. That was Queens College in New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, so I enjoyed those both of those places. I went to, um, I had a scholarship to the um, Brooklyn Museum. They had an art school in there for a while back in the day. And that was really cool. And that was actually what brought me to New York City. So I enjoyed that, too. But um, I did go to many art schools. Well, I went to many colleges, and I did. I knew after like the first year that I really wanted to major in art and have my focus mostly there. So I appreciated the fact that I did go to so many schools and study with so many teachers because it gave me a broad background, and I got many different viewpoints. And I think that's very important. And I, I do know that there are many teachers out there that maybe have a little bit too much ego involved and it's their way or the highway and really want people to do it their way. And that doesn't, you know, one way doesn't work for everyone. And that is what I find has damaged some of the people that finally get to my classes. So um, I am grateful that I came across some of those people, but then I moved on. Mm -hmm. Well, I can see how that would benefit you as a teacher also because you have experience with lots of different ways of doing things and you seem to have the flexibility to then be able to better assist a student in finding their own way. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like from what you said, you've done a lot of traveling. How do you feel that's influenced your art? Um, I like, I like new, I like change. I like new surroundings. I can get inspired by from staying in the same place. But for me, it's so much easier to find um, inspiration in a new place, at least for a while. And it's, I don't know, uh, being a nomad is uh, just in my my blood. Other people may not care so much about travel. But it definitely gets me very excited. And when I go to a new place, especially when I first get there, I just, you know, it's going to be like, uh, stop the car and pull over every five minutes. And <laughs> I always, it's true. And, and, you know, my friends um, that have traveled with me or when I go see them, they know this about me. So they're prepared that uh, hopefully they're going to have a book with them or they're just going to meditate for a little while because I get really excited when I see something I want to paint. And if I've got my paints with me, I will be pretty willful about wanting to do it right then and there. And otherwise, I'll just take a picture. But I really prefer to work from life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, you answered my next question. That was going to be whether you're, if you're doing a combination of working on the spot and taking photos or, or doing one or the other. Yeah, it's a combo. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can see where energetically being on the spot. Do you often like start your painting and then finish it elsewhere? Yes, I didn't used to. I used to not want to do that. And um, I don't know. I'm opening to the fact that I can make changes. And lately, I do that. And I come home and I have enough memory And, you know, I take a lot of photos to document it, but it's kind of funny when I get home, I end up not even looking at the photos and just finishing it either from memory or um, making some changes. And I used to be much more of a purist where I felt that I needed to um, really um, paint it exactly as it was. But these days I take more um, artistic license. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's interesting because I would have thought it's so much easier now. I mean, remember the days when you had to, you know, take your photos and then you had to take them to the photo store and get them developed. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yes. (laughs) And now you can just snap a picture and you've got it and you can use it right away. (laughs) I know. It's amazing. It really is when you think about it. I I remember hating to take pictures because I was never good at composition. And, um, you know, and I really didn't like my pictures. Now I can take anything and I can crop it to make the composition really nice. (laughs) (laughs) And that's valid.
salad. That's okay because you know, now you have the analytical ability to know what makes a strong composition. Right, right. Oh, good. So you're saying I'm not cheating. That's good. No, you're not cheating. <laughs> and you know, it's so funny. Lately, I tell my students, you know, if they're in the water, I've had people come to class and they just want to paint and they have absolutely no background at all. And they have never taken a drawing class. I'm thinking of my last workshop a couple of weeks ago. And I knew that this one woman was going to be so unhappy if she didn't get the figure in there in a semi- correct way so i took out some tracing paper and i said look it's okay you can trace this and then you can have fun in the rest of the painting in the background you know just learning to use the paint so everything is okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's no one right or wrong way yeah you think yep yeah, uh i i hadn't even thought of tracing that's an interesting idea <laughs> it's not cheating <laughs> <laughs> so it, it really sounds like your your passion these days is is supporting and nurturing yes absolutely. spark in other people yeah. very much so yes so how do you do that online oh yeah okay you know it's interesting because i was talking to a woman last night because she couldn't decide she had a budget she couldn't decide well should i take the online class or should i come in person and really what i have found is that um and i'm going to say the women i mean it is for whatever reason, that's been my path. I, I've had quite a few male students too in the past, but this was when I was focusing more on technique. Um, but the women are getting the same thing, both from being in person and online. So um, the way that I nurture someone, well, we have um, a discussion. We have, um, I have a, a class coming up. It's called um, Empowered Woman Online Course. And in that course, we're going to have a private Facebook group I send out assignments, I send out guided visualizations and some videos, and then, um, then the women uh, work on their creations, whether it is going to be writing or whether it's going to be painting or what have you, and they post them on our private Facebook page, and then we have several telecalls where everyone is on there and we take turns and feed back to the women about what it is that they've created. So in my feedback, whether it is uh, directly on the Facebook page or on the telecall, I am um, giving positive feedback, um, positive, so that it's not going to stunt them as an artist, but it's going to encourage the strong points of what it is that they're doing so that they can continue to move ahead with confidence. And the assignments that I am giving are around the the theme of empowerment so i am carefully constructing this course to have us all look within and notice the places that may need some more attention and nurturing so that we can be all of who we came here to be that sounds awesome now i did catch something that you were saying it sounds like you because you said writing too so so this is for any creative endeavor it sounds like not just art it is for any creative endeavor i've had a dancer come through um oh, I've had people who like to cook um <laughs> yeah you know so it's all creative and um, most of the people that come for whatever reason are painting mm -hmm. or drawing or photographing mm -hmm. i had a photographer come through mm -hmm. so i've been doing this for a few years now um and fine-tuning it but uh, people can do whatever they want. Great. So what, so what are some of the other disciplines? Because I, I think this will, uh, I hadn't thought of that, you know. And so someone who maybe is a dancer and is feeling stuck or feeling like they need inspiration, uh, this might be the thing for them. Whereas originally I was thinking it was just art. So what, what might be some of the other? Uh, well, what I've had is uh, three-dimensional and a dancer. Um, People do write, but I haven't had, I don't think I've had a dedicated writer. Mm -hmm. I've had people who really love to cook and they'll share their recipes and they'll share, they'll share photos of what it is that they have uh, created. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think there's anything outside of that, but it's not limited. And, you know, the woman who was the dancer didn't post photos, but she, she said that the assignments were really helpful for her in terms of her choreography. So I'm not, 
you know, she wasn't uh, on there too much, so I'm not exactly sure how that played out, but she did find it helpful. That was the feedback I had anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Cool. And when is this? This is a beginning, um, it's starting February 6th, so that's coming up soon, mm -hmm. and going through April 4th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And how often do you uh, do this for, like, say, someone who, this is one of the things I like about a podcast, is it stays out there in the ethers for anyone to access, um, you know, a year down the line. Uh, how often do you do this? Um, well, you know, it's been interesting because it's been almost a year since I did one. The year before that, I did it maybe three go-rounds. Or well, the last two years, I did it maybe three go-rounds per year. So I, I'm not sure um, mm -hmm. exactly when the next one will be. Um, I like, uh, I, I really am quite a free spirit. So I like things to shift as they need to shift. And like I said, a lot of my focus has been on the destination uh, workshops you know I'm going to take a group to Ireland in May and um, I've got one that is going to be so far again in um, Italy again in 2019 so I knew I was going to be home for this amount of time and I, I love doing these in the winter when everyone is kind of cozy yeah. in their house and <laughs> Helps well, leave the depression of winter. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I don't know when, you know, there's not really with me in my life, there's not a whole lot of how often. <laughs> I get that. It, the muse has, to, uh, has yes. to hit you. So for someone who's listening to this down the line and, and w is interested, they'll just have to go to your website and, and uh, see if the muse in you has decided on another online course. Yes, they can sign up for my mailing list, and then they will, which you can do that on my website, melissaharris.com, and then they can, um, they can follow along and jump in whenever they want. Okay, so is melissaharris.com, that's your website, and that's also where people can purchase your book? Books, yes. Both of your books, and... Uh, um, uh, prints, and prints. greeting cards. Okay, yes, let's talk about what... Uh, let's see, how should I say, what mediums do you use to express your art? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, you mean products or mediums? Yeah, product. yeah products. Oh, products. Yeah. Okay, so what I have, I have greeting cards, I have prints, I have original artwork, mm -hmm. I have high-end clay prints, um, I have two different card decks, there's a little mini one called Goddess on the Go, which is really cute and um the woman who created it uh, i'm not the creator i'm the artist but that's a really adorable one and uh then the, my own card deck the anything is possible card deck and then i have two books 99 keys to a creative life and the other one is called painting outside the lines and that is uh, more of a memoir but it does have some tips for intuition and creative creativity in there Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And are you still doing spirit portraits at all? Or I do. I'm going to be doing them in Florida in March. I have a friend who has a crystal store there. Um, I've cut back. I used to travel a lot all over the country and doing them at different new age stores or centers and can't do everything. So I'm doing less of them, but I do do them and often it's uh, for people that have uh, store owners that have become friends. So mm -hmm. in places I like to go, Florida's not bad. To go to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you may as well go where you, you know, where, where you find your interest lies, not somewhere that you don't want to be. Um, yeah. So what is a spirit portrait? A spirit portrait is uh, I give someone a reading, um, intuitive reading, psychic reading, and then um, we talk about what it is that I have discovered uh, when I'm tuning in. Mm -hmm. and then I take those elements and put them into a watercolor painting. Um, and it's not just blobs of color and aura painting like you see with some people. It's a, a real developed painting. And you can see samples of those on my website, too. Mm -hmm. And the process, and then the person goes home with the painting. And it's uh, meant to be something that will be inspiring or helpful to them as they move forward on their path. Things that they might want to remember from the session or things that might keep them going if they've got a particular issue something like that and sometimes people get them to celebrate um you know i do couples as well so sometimes oh. 
Yeah, it's a really cool uh, gift to yourself for your anniversary or a wedding present. Um, I've done a lot of um, gifts, you know, for couples that way. Oh, that's a nice idea. Now, what if somebody can't be with you? Can you, is there a way for you to still? Yeah, I still do them um, remotely. Um, the person or people send me some questions and I tune in um, at a distance. And I have had feedback that they are very accurate this way. So then we'll have a conversation by phone or Skype to um, review some of the things and maybe if they have other questions they want to ask. And then I'll do the painting here in my studio and send it to them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you can, um, do you use uh, photos at all or? Um, I actually, after we have the session, whatever comes out in the session, uh, you know, after I've spoken with them, I will lately, my, and didn't used to always do this, but um, I will have them take a photograph or have someone take a photograph of them in a particular position that I find might work well for the painting mm-hmm. and then uh, send me that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's great to know because everyone can't come to your studio or, or go to Florida or... <laughs> Right. <laughs> if they're interested. Awesome. Oh, you know, there's one other thing I wanted to, I thought might be interesting because we were talking about thyroid issues and heavy metal poisoning and as related to working with, with oil paint, is, is that? Yeah, well, it's any, it's actually many different art materials. And, you know, these days, uh, the suppliers, the manufacturers are being so much more careful than they did in the past. And so the, the uh, ingredients that are going into paint and solvents are less toxic and at least we're aware of them now and we know to wear gloves and to ventilate so it is important for all artists to be aware of the toxins and uh, protect themselves watercolor is not such a big deal acrylic not such a big deal Um, unless of course you're rubbing these things into your skin your skin can can absorb the pigments and some of the pigments are still quite toxic you know you'll find cadmium and lead um, and nickel you know in some of these paints Mm -hmm. so it is important to be aware of that especially if you're doing uh, oil-based painting or pastels because the dust from the pastels is toxic uh, see now that's good to know i because i even somebody who is just playing around with these needs to be aware that um that there can be a problem with heavy metals yeah absolutely so even in water so in there is some in watercolors too you think in the in the in the dyes um in the pigments yes the pigments. probably but you know really we don't touch the paint that much in watercolor there are cer- there are certain colors that are more toxic than others and i don't really know what they are off the top of my head but you know you should wash your hands after you use your watercolors but you know they're not going to be airborne like they would be you know they are somewhat can be somewhat airborne with the oil paints and especially with the solvents the solvents is where you find your real problems and what crossed my mind was maybe um, if you're using your fingers to smush colors around. Right, uh, right. And we don't really do that much with watercolor, mm-hmm. um, but pastels and oil pastels. And for me, even the oil paint, I used to do that a lot. So yes, you're right. Mm-hmm. And I can see, especially pastels, you would, uh, if you're not using one of those smudging tools, um, right. You, know, you might just, just probably, I, I could see it just being easier to just get your finger in there and to smudge around rather than to grab a smudging tool. Yes, absolutely. So something to be aware of and to be careful of. And someone who perhaps has been using a lot of uh, oils and maybe pastels and is finding that for some reason they're not feeling as good as they used to might be a good thing to get checked on. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah, I just I just thought of that that it's uh, a a good good thing to bring up. This has been really great. I'm I'm very grateful for you to uh, come on and and talk about your art and and how you can help people to bring out the artist in everyone. Is there anything that you'd like to close with that maybe some words of encouragement or uh, a little something that uh, else that you, you did give one example of something that people can do to help uh, bring their 
right brain out. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share before we end? Oh, wow. Uh, let's see. Um, hmm. <laughs> it would be hard to pick one thing. I think well, what you I would do more than one if you want. <laughs> well, I would encourage people to, um, to I encourage people to meditate so that they can stay in touch with their inner being and to, to know if they've got something that wants to come out and consider how they might want to express that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the rest is too, there's too many, there's 99 of those keys in my book. So that, no, I'm not to plug my book, but you know, no, I, I think the, book, the 99 keys to a creative life is a really great resource. If people are interested in expanding their creativity. Um, but I think probably meditation is at the top of the list. Okay. I really appreciate your having me on here and uh, people are welcome to ask me questions if they have them. Um, they can contact me through my website. Um, Which is once again. It's uh, once again is melissaharris.com. And I do love to connect with people and I really enjoy helping people in terms of their creative process. So that's, that would be lovely. Oh, that's great. I, we need more people like you. <laughs> oh, thank you. And more people like you who are taking <laughs> the time to interview and connect with people that have something they'd like to share. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Well, it is something that I have been finding that I love doing. It's a, such a great way to reconnect with people who I've lost touch with and connect with new people like yourself. Fabulous. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really right, appreciate well, thank it. You. The, the website, there'll be a link on the podcast website, realjanine.com. You can find show notes there, guest bios. There'll be links to Melissa's information. You can listen and download the uh, any of the episodes, any of the back episodes from the website. Um, and also from your favorite podcast app, you can subscribe to the podcast and you'll automatically receive new episodes as they're available. So you can sign up for the podcast email list. I'll send you emails. I won't send a lot, just two or three a month to keep you posted of new episodes, current thoughts, um, be kind of like a little blog maybe projects and there'll always be a recipe from Janine's kitchen so you've been listening to keeping it real with Janine I hope you found my conversation with Melissa Harris fun and inspiring do you know someone who might benefit from listening to Melissa today please share the love with your family and friends thank you so much and remember Janine is J-A-N-E-A-N -E the podcast website is realjanine.com. Take care and be well.